What up guys, and welcome back to another episode of TV Time with Jay. I am of course your host Jay, and today we will be reviewing Lucifer Season 5 Part 1. That's right, Lucy fans, the devil is back. And uh, this time, for a fifth season, and Season 6 has already been confirmed. Uh, so, uh, this first part is only 8 episodes, and uh, I do Netflix stuff a little bit differently than I do my week-to-week -week reviews. Um, since Netflix and you know and streaming services and stuff tend to do binge drops, I you know wait a little bit. I give it you know a few days after the you know initial drop has happened. And uh, in these reviews, I cover the entirety of the season or in this case half season and go into full spoiler territory so if you have not seen all eight episodes of lucifer season five part one i highly recommend you go do so also if you want to hear my thoughts about lucifer season four uh, lucky for you i did actually do a video on here uh, last year um, talking about season four, which I will leave in the end card and annotated right up here somewhere. I'm, I hope I'm pointing in the right direction. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and talk about Lucifer season four because, uh, man, this was a doozy for sure. So, Lucifer season five. I know I said four earlier. That was my bad. Uh, so, damn, this season was absolutely amazing what we're gonna do here uh, instead of just going by events of the show in chronological order I kind of want to talk individually about each character and kind of my thoughts on their development you know what they went through and kind of how my opinions have changed on certain characters and you know how certain characters have evolved so we're gonna start off by talking about detective douche himself Dan. So, I'm not going to lie to you guys, Dan is probably my least favorite character on Lucifer, at least he was for a, a long time. Um, not just because, you know, Lucifer hated him, Dan was just kind of annoying. That was until Charlotte came into the picture, and then I started to really vibe with Dan, and I thought Dan, you know, I mean, I always knew Dan was a good guy, uh, but like, this actually like endeared me to Dan and like the loss he went through losing Charlotte not once because you know of course the goddess form of Charlotte you know Lucifer's mom and then a second time as well when she you know as her mortal self like her regular self Charlotte uh, passed an amenity you know gave her a one-way ticket to the Silver City which was you know phenomenal and a beautiful beautiful send-off for the character uh, but of course you know it had a huge impact on Dan and because of that you know Dan you know went to some dark places with Maze last season you know going all vigilante justice and then you know now in season five he's you know really trying to better himself he's like you know reading all these self-help books trying all these different methods, you know, the chakras and the bracelets and stuff like that. And in this season in particular, we actually get to see a really, like, legitimate friendship develop between Dan and Lucifer. Like, yes, sure, there's still that, like, teasing back and forth, which has always been a core part of their dynamic. But at this point... There are mo more moments where Lucifer actually takes Dan seriously, and they listen, and they bond, and they understand each other. And of course, they bond the most over their mutual love for Chloe. And uh, one of my favorite episodes with the Lucifer and Dan friendship is, of course, the episode where Lucifer is introduced to Jed, Chloe's ex, who, of course, Dan hates with a passion. And I love that Dan is the person that tells Lucifer, like, dude... He played you. He got into your head so that he could get to Chloe. You need to just go there and talk to her, man. Otherwise, you're going to end up missing out on her. And, you know, take it from somebody who made that mistake. Don't do it. I really appreciate that. Dan has really grown as a character, and I've grown to really appreciate him. So that's a, a huge shift for that character in particular. Now, let's move on to Linda. 
So Linda, there isn't, you know, too much of a shift in terms of her characterization that much, but we get to learn more about Linda's past and we get to kind of see why she's so obsessive uh, with raising Charlie, not just because, you know, he is possibly half angel, but also because, you know, she ended up having a baby very young and she decided to give it up for adoption because she wasn't ready for it. And she has felt guilty about it for years. And so because of this, she really wants to go all in on Charlie, but also she has this fear and this guilt that she'll never be a good mother. Um, and you know, this kind of makes her realize, okay, I know how hell works now because of Lucifer and I know that it's all tied to guilt. This means I'm definitely going to hell. Oh no, what am I going to do? And she has this whole existential crisis. And this ties uh, directly into Maze's storyline. And uh, my god, this is one of my favorite plot lines of this season just in general. I love Maze's storyline. So Maze herself, you know, last season discovered that she could fall in love. She ended up developing feelings for Eve. Now, of course, Eve, her actress, uh, was confirmed not to be in this season. Uh, so Eve was not around in season five. Um, and she felt like Eve left her. I mean, Eve, you know, made the explanation that, you know, after everything with, you know, Adam and then, you know, reconnecting with Lucifer, she realized that she needed to figure out herself before she could properly love somebody else. And you know what? That's actually a very mature and, you know, sound step forward if she really does want to, um, you know, have a legitimate relationship. And I think that's necessary for her and Maze. But Maze herself feels like Eve abandoned her. And he fe she feels like Lucifer abandoned her because, of course, in order to not only save Charlie but to protect Chloe and everybody else he cares about on Earth from the demons trying to invade again or, you know, trying to take Charlie or, or you know, causing chaos in hell which would spill over to Earth, uh, Lucifer decides to actually take up his duties and rule over hell. Um, and because of this, Lucifer is like, Maze, you're not my servant anymore. You don't have to come with me. You know, you seem to be having a good life here with, you know, Chloe, Trixie, and everybody. You have friends, you know. You can stay here. You're fine. Um, but, you know, Maze, who has been attached to Lucifer's hip for as long as she can remember, she feels like that one person who was always there for her abandoned her. And she felt hurt by it. She didn't really talk to him about it, but she felt really hurt by it. And then eventually, um, due to Michael's machinations, uh, she discovers that Lucifer had, did not tell Maze about her mother Lilith and her mother giving up her immortality and, you know, living a life as a mortal woman. And so when Maze finally got to confront her mother, she didn't really get to say anything. And then by the time she finally gets the courage to talk to her again she passes and so she doesn't ever get that closure and so that you know anger and resentment builds up in maze this shows a really complex character in mazikeen you know for a long time uh you know a lot of people kind of slept on her and just thought she was like the sexy badass chick there's so much more going on with her and i really really feel for her there's so much depth there and I cannot wait to see more of that explored. Uh, she was really interesting. One of the highlights of the season for me, uh, for sure. Like, hats off to her actress, 100%. So, now we move on to Amenadiel. Amenadiel, um, his friendship with Dan. We talked about Dan before and his friendship with Lucifer. But Amenadiel's friendship with Dan and, you know, Dan giving dad advice and, um, you know, being there for his buddy was absolutely fantastic. I loved Amenadiel struggling with fatherhood and then also kind of worrying that, you know, his son's not like him. He's just going to be a normal kid, which means 
he's not going to be immune to normal kid things, which means he can get sick, which means he can suffer, which means he has to live a mortal life, and he'll have to watch his son die as he grows old. And, you know, that's something that, you know, of course, regular parents have to worry about, you know, on a daily basis, you know, like, you know, being there for their child and, you know, not really knowing what's going to happen in their life. But with Emmanuel, it's a whole nother level because he's a celestial being. So he literally has to watch, you know, his son, you know, one of the most precious people in his life disappear over what would seem to him like the blink of an eye because it's just, you know, maybe 50, 60, possibly 70 years if he gets lucky. But to him, that's nothing. He's a fucking angel. He's been around since the beginning of time. So, like, to him, it's just a drop in the bucket. And that scares him. And Michael really gets into his head with that. And it's pretty interesting to see kind of Amenadiel's reaction to all this. It's pretty fun. Um, I like to see uh, this kind of shift in the, you know, usually cool, calm, and collected Amenadiel. Uh, pretty solid stuff. So now, we're going to go to Chloe. Uh, no, we're going to go to Ella really quick. Oh, man, Ella's my favorite character, and uh, they need to leave my baby alone. They need to leave her alone. Uh, poor Ella. She has gone through the ringer. You know, uh, she kind of faced her bad boy dating habit and decided to finally, you know, go for the nice guy. And then... Only to find out in the uh, amazing two-parter uh, serial killer mystery episode that her new nice guy boyfriend was a fucking serial killer. That, oh my god, that was just, wow. Why would you do that to Ella? That hurt me. Someone hug this woman. I will hug her. She deserves all the hugs. Just, why would you do that to Ella? I felt so bad, man. And also, I loved uh, that Mays and Ella's friendship got more highlighted in this season. I think Lucifer does a really great job with female friendships in general. Now, granted, I'm a dude, uh, so, like, you know, my perspective is pretty limited when it comes to this type of stuff. But I feel like the friendships that we see here between every, you know, female main member of the cast of, you know, Chloe and Mays, Chloe and Ella, Ella and Mays. Uh, Linda and Mays, uh, Linda and Ella, stuff like that. It's all pretty great, uh, and I thought it was pretty fantastic uh, in this half of the season as well. So, um, uh, in conclusion with Ella, leave Ella alone, uh, give Ella a hug, and uh, somebody please just let her be happy. Let her be happy. All right, so finally we're going to talk about Lucifer, Chloe, and we're going to wrap it up also with Michael. So, I really liked Lucifer um, in the beginning like in hell trying to help Chloe with the case indirectly and then realizing that you know maybe he does need to come back maybe he does need to kind of like you know settle things and you know reconnect with everybody um, at first he does it to kind of deal with Michael's shenanigans but then he realizes okay you know you know what I'm meant to be here and I think it was really cool. Um, I am very glad that the Michael situation with him trying to take over Lucifer's life uh, did not drag. Uh, I was also um, thankful that Chloe did not buy this crap, you know, for all that long. As soon as she said something was off, she jumped and figured it out. That was great. I loved how Lucifer dealt with Michael. I loved Tom Ellis' performance as Michael. His American accent was great. I love that his posture was different. That, you know, basically everything that Lucifer is, Michael is the opposite of. So he is a, you know, whereas Lucifer is a charming, you know, suave, very much, you know, honest to the point of uh, it hurts people and he doesn't really care. Uh, Michael is more smarmy, he's more, like, conniving, he's a liar, despite the fact that Lucifer has the title of Print of Lies. Um, it's pretty interesting, it's a fun dynamic, and seeing Michael as this, like, Machiavellian schemer who's literally, you know, been manipulating 
everything in Lucifer's creation and life since pretty much the dawn of time, at least according to him. Uh, I think the big man has something to say about that, and uh, that brings me to the fact that, holy shit, I did not expect the ending that we got. I knew that God was going to be featured in the season, but the fact that he showed up in the mid-season finale instead of the season finale uh, kind of caught me off guard. That means we're going to get an entire half of the season where God at least shows up in a few episodes. That's pretty crazy. Uh, overall, this season was phenomenal, and I cannot wait to see more. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Cannot wait for the second half of the season and, of course, for the final season, season six. Of course, Lucifer ends on season six. One of the devil's numbers. Uh, absolutely ph uh, phenomenal. And uh, points for the irony. Overall, like I said, this season was great. But let me know your thoughts and feels in the comments down below. Any fellow Lucy fans out there, tell me how you felt about this season. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Also... Don't forget to leave this video a like to let me know you enjoyed it. And if you like what I do here and you want to see more from me, be sure to hit that subscribe button and notification bell so you get notified every time I upload a new video. In the outro card, I will leave linked, like I said, my Lucifer Season 4 review in case you want to hear my thoughts on Season 4 and you missed out on that. And I will leave linked a video YouTube's Mysterious Algorithm thinks you might like. But until next time, guys, this is Jay from Mysterious Reviews. And like I always say, once a comic book geek, always a comic book geek. And once a TV fan, always a TV fan. Uh, I'll catch you guys next time on TV Time with Jay. Peace.